Let's continue the setup of the Flash System 9150 here in the lab in Littleton, Massachusetts. Here's Joshua Bloomer to finish up the rest of it. We're going to start the initial setup of the Flash System 9100. We have already given the system during the initial configuration an IP address for the cluster. We will now log in with the default username and password of superuser and password all lowercase with a zero. Once we sign in, we're going to come to the welcome screen and we will see all the steps on the left hand side that we're going to have to complete to finish our setup. We have a few prerequisites, which is making sure that the system is cabled properly, we have any licenses that we're going to need for the system, and all the IP addresses we need for call home and remote support are already available to us. So now we will click next. We will see the license agreement at this point, and if you want to, you can scroll through and see all the requirements and statements in the license agreement. We also have an addendum, Java notices, some non-IBM licenses, and additional licenses and notices which you can download. Once you've reviewed those, you can select I agree with the terms and the conditions of these licenses and move on to the next step. Since the default password is well known, you may want to secure your system by setting a, a, a new password for the system that is more secure. So we're going to do that right now. We will apply that new password. We see that it was successful and we move on to the next step. Here we see that the default name for the cluster, since 9100 is a clustered system because it has two nodes or more, is right now the name of the system, uh, the name cluster, plus its IP address. We may want to use something that's a little more creative, and so we'll do that now. We'll apply that new name and move on from here. There are some license functions in the system. Uh, those additional licenses um, can be used, can be set for the system. We see that we have remote mirroring and we have the number of terabytes of remote mirroring we've purchased. You can click on it and select the little question mark and it'll show you into the capacity that is available for Metro Mirror and Global Mirror. Same thing is true for flash copy. We can enter a capacity number for those. And then we can also set how much tier zero flash we have, how much tier one flash, how much enterprise tier we have, and what is our near line tier. Since this is a 9100, uh, all licenses are included by default, uh, but we will just set them for now to show you. We're not gonna be doing any external, we may or may not be doing external virtualization, uh, we can set that here. We don't have to set them at this point. We can set them at a future date. But this is if you want to set them during the initial setup. Let's go ahead and configure. We do need to set the date and time of the system. So we would select that date and time at this point. Uh, what we're looking for here is setting either manually setting the date and time or getting it from an NTP server. We will use the NTP server that is known to our setup. And here we set our time zone, which is in the eastern time zone of the U.S. We can actually look here since it's running a task, and we can actually see the commands it used to set the NTP server. And here we have an SVC task, change system, minus NTP IP, and the IP address. And here we set the time zone. If you want to set up the encryption option and you've purchased the licensing for encryption, you could set it up here. 
Uh, we're not going to do that at this time. You can always set that up at a later date. Here you want to put in information about the system. Some of this has already been populated. You see that it's set up for IBM internal lab and here's our here's the location of the lab. Again, you can highlight the question mark next to each one of these sections and you can see what they're looking for. Here we look at the primary contact information of, for the system in the lab. Here we have the main user who's or administrator, his, his or her email address and phone number. The system has a capability of doing call home. We can enable that and set its reporting interval. Here we see it's been turned on and we can tell it how to configure it and we can send configuration data. If you have some sensitive information that you don't want sent, you can collect sensor sensitive data and names and certain information, network information, certificates, usernames, host names will all be stripped out when it sends that information. We can turn it off or we can turn it on. So we now proceed to the next task. Here we put in the IP address of the email server, the SMTP server, to relay SMTP mail for call home. Uh, we see that I've already pre-populated it. We have, can choose to see if it's pingable from the lab location we're at, and we see the default port of port 25 for the email server. We'll just apply that and hit next. Now the next screen is where if you want to use the new IBM Storage Insights to monitor the health and record uh, performance information on your system. If you already have an IBM, IBM ID, you can enter that now and be registered with your system. I'm going to go ahead and use my IBM ID at this point and I'll register it with my already Storage Insights ID. If you want to learn more about Storage Insights, there's a fact sheet that you can click on it'll up a new, and you can learn more about these, what IBM Insights is capable of. We are now registered with Storage Insights and we can start using it, um, but we'll continue on with the setup of the screen. If you want remote assistance, which would allow IBM support personnel to access the system remotely, we can set that up as well. I can click on here and say I want to allow that. The first bar shows that you can have it where people have to come on site to work on the system, or if you want to allow remote access and on site access, we would click on here. You can set up the IP addresses for remote support centers. Um, they are pre-populated in this particular case. We will go ahead and use the defaults. If you're set up behind a firewall and you need to use a proxy server, you can enter in your proxy configuration information here. And you would put in the name of the proxy server, its IP address, and its port number. You can also specify when you want to allow remote support. This is for at any time so that people can get to it when there's a problem or only when you enable permission so that you can say I can turn on or off the remote access. In a more secure environment you'd want to select permission only. In this environment we're going to say at any time. And now we've completed all the fill-in steps. We can see a little summary of everything we've done. The system name, its current code level, the NTP server it's going to be synchronizing time and date with, the current date and time that it has, system location, contact information, email server IP, and the call home information. All of that's been set up at this point. And now we're going to finish the final setup. We're going to turn off the easy setup option 
So if we ever wanted to get back to this set, this initial screen, we can actually say minus easy setup equals yes, and it'll restore us back to logging in and doing the easy setup environment. And here's the overview of our environment. We have the initial dashboard showing the performance of the system. Right now there's nothing going on, so everything is pretty much at zero. The capacity, we haven't configured capacity, we haven't configured any volumes, and therefore there's no calculations on capacity savings from data reduction. We can also look at the system health. We have an error, probably related to the fact we haven't configured anything. And it's showing that we have 24 drives. They're offline because we're not, they're not currently in use. We see that we have one I.O. group. We have two nodes. They're online and ready to go. And there's a warning here about connectivity. So the call home has failed. We'll have to check to see that we can reach the SMTP server at this point. And then we can resolve this issue. So that's the initial setup. And now that we've finished the initial setup, let's take a look at firmware updates. In this video, we're going to show how to update the firmware of the FS9100. If we notice that when we log into the overview screen, we see recommended update. If we click on that, it's going to tell us that there is a recommended update for the system. We are at this current level, and there's a recommended level that we, we should be advised to go to. If we actually click on update now, it'll take us directly to the settings section of the system where there's an update system page. At this point you will have had to have downloaded the test utility and the actual firmware for updating the system. Those can be found on the Fix Central page. By going to Fix Central you can navigate to the 9100 system and then select um, the firmware update section and download that software. I've done that here. When we come back to our system, we can either test the system to see if it's ready to be updated, or we can test, tell it to test and then update. If it doesn't pass the test or if there are warnings, we'll get notified and then we'll have to decide what to do there. I've already downloaded the test utility and it's over here, upgrade and test. I'm going to select that downloaded the latest firmware. I will go ahead and select that as well. We then select Next. We have two choices here. We can do a manual update or an automatic. The automatic is the preferred way of doing our update since it takes us through all the tests and does it in the appropriate format. Uh, if there's any issues with the system, you may be required to do it through the manual mode we're going to select automatic. You can also tell it to uh, pause after the update and you can check things during because it's going to do one note at a time or we can say fully automatic. We'll select fully automatic. It then goes ahead and copies the test utility and the update firmware to the system and when that's uploaded it will go ahead and first run the test and then if everything passes, we can choose to update the system. We can see now that it's running the test update utility. And we see the status of our nodes in the overall system. The test utility has successfully passed and now we will see that the system is going to update. It will do one node at a time we will see an overall progress of the system as it moves along. It will take one node offline, flash the system, reboot it, bring it back online, wait a specified time period, and then do the second node, and then overall do the entire system. This will take some time to proceed, so you can go ahead and do other things while this is running. Josh brings up a great point. Why don't you go ahead and click on part three while this firmware update continues.